Okay, members, it's now time for questions to the Executive Office. And before I call the first member, I want to say that questions 7 and 10 have been withdrawn. And I call Matthew O'Toole to ask the first question. Matthew, Mr O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question 1. Um, whilst we have differing views on the decision to leave the EU and on the protocol, we are committed to working together to achieve the best possible outcome for our local businesses, and we will continue to do so. As an executive, we regularly review the impacts arising from the end of the transition period, and we continue to raise the concerns with both the Westminster Government and the EU on many issues, including in relation to SBS checks. Any decision on veterinary arrangements in relation to goods, and che or goods checks is the responsibility of the British Government. However, in seeking the best possible outcome for our citizens and for traders, we have continued to highlight to Whitehall and to the EU the impact that these issues are having on our businesses. We have been clear that any solutions to these issues need to, to reflect the practical impacts and should also be developed in liaison with our business community. We have continued to stress that solutions need to be simple, need to be practical, and need to be affordable. Nicole Matthew to supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And before I ask a question, can I um, uh, acknowledge this is the first time we've been in the chamber since the first minister uh, announced her uh, decision to depart. While um, uh, she and I don't agree on very much, perhaps uh, we, we, perhaps we agree on a degree of frustration at times with the Democratic Unionist Party. But we'll leave it at that. Can I wish her and her family all the best? Uh, uh, as we move on. Um, uh, Deputy First Minister, um, we know there are difficulties with our post-Brexit trading arrangements. Um, I'm glad that you agree that a, a veterinary arrangement will be good to smooth those issues, but we also need a focus on the positive benefits that our unique market access can bring us. Can I ask what you and the Executive Office more broadly are doing to reassure investors, given that an invest, a major multinational investor told the Financial Times this week that they have looked at the opportunities from the protocol, but the current scenes in Northern Ireland mean they think it might be uninvestable. That is not good enough. What is the Executive Office doing, not just to reassure investors, get to but question, to get them please? here? Thank you. Well, um, well, firstly, can I say to, to the member that it is all of our responsibility, all of us in political leadership, to work to make uh, politics work for everybody and it has to deliver for everybody. Uh, none of us want to see the scenes that we saw on our streets over the course of recent weeks for that to, uh, to reoccur. And we all need to go out of our way to make sure that's the case. Um, certainly, we wouldn't want that to be a factor in terms of determining um, people's decisions as to whether not to invest here to create employment opportunities and all the prosperity that comes with that. So, um, I can say to the member that as part of um, recovery and moving forward, particularly in terms of um, economic recovery, the Department of the Economy have published a, a plan. The executive are working on the new programme for government, the economic recovery package the post-COVID uh, response, and I think a combination of those things means that we need to be looking towards what are the opportunities that are now presented to us. You have referred to this yourself on a number of occasions, and there are opportunities now um, afforded to us, markets open to us, um, and I think we need to uh, work, make that work for our, our advantage in the time ahead, and I will work with all executive ministers to make sure that's the case. John O'Dowd. Can I also wish Mrs Foster all the, and our family all the best for the future? Uh, in terms of, of the protocol, um, as Mr O'Toole has pointed out, there are opportunities for businesses, there are also challenges for businesses, but would uh, the Minister agree with me that the alternative of a no-deal Brexit would have been devastating not only for the economy here, but the economies across these islands? Yes, I mean, of course, and, and we have always said that from, from day one, and as, as, as the member uh, noted, that we have been afforded special status and through the protocol, that facilitates our unique and uh, continued access to the EU single market. And it gives us that opportunity to be the gateway for um, the sale of goods to two of the world's um, largest markets. Local businesses and manufacturers and our farmers and traders want to see the protocol implemented so they can avail of the protections that it affords them and also the special status that it affords the North. We are now the only place where businesses can operate free from customs declarations, rules of origin certificates and non-tariff barriers on the sale of goods to both Britain and the EU. So going forward, we need to build on that, and we need to build on the strength that the all-island economy uh, brings us to attract jobs and investment. So the British government must now um, get on with implementing the protocol in full, and any delays to the full implementation of the protocol, which is our protection against the worst excesses of the hard Brexit, clearly risks any future stability and growth and prosperity, which um, even the previous uh, member referred to. So I think the you are right to say that the prospect of a no-deal Brexit would have been deeply damaging, destructive and probably 
even more so very disruptive, not only to our economy, but also to our peace process. I call Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Deputy First Minister for her comments so far. And may I too sort of wish all the best for the First Minister in the future and all the rest of it, and say that indeed we might have had our sort of differences, but we wish you all the best for the future. But the question is quite clear. The Ulster Unionist Party has put together some several practical suggestions on how to deal with issues of SBS and trading issues as well. Will the Deputy First Minister and the First Ministers commit to bring all parties together to be able to discuss these proposals from the Ulster Unionist Party and indeed with Maria Sefcovic and the EU rather than talking over our heads, actually dealing with the people of Northern Ireland where these issues actually matter the most? Well, I'll remind the, the member that the executive meets every week and all executive parties discuss these issues, uh, try to work our way through it, make the case for what's in the best interests of the business community um, here, try to find resolution to the issues that we need to find resolution to. I welcome the fact that there has been some progress across a whole raft of issues. However, there are still uh, more to be done. Um, I welcome the fact that the, there's a commitment from the co-chairs, um, Joint Committee, Specialised Committee, all that work is continuing to find um, resolution to the areas and I, and I think that hopefully in the weeks ahead we will see some progress in that. Uh, what's important for our business community, as I said in my original answer, is that we have certainty, that we have stability, that people can plan for the future based on knowing exactly what is coming down the tracks. So, um, I mean, it's very clear that the protocol isn't up for renegotiation. Um, there are new post-Brexit realities that we have to uh, work our way through. And I think that um, whilst there has been progress to date, there's still a way to go there. But let's continue to work together to find the resolutions that we all want to find for what's in the best interest of the local economy here. Nicole John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I take this opportunity also on behalf of Alliance colleagues to wish the First Minister all the very best for the future. I first met the First Minister when she was doing her duty in my constituency in South Antrim, and I was a local councillor. I saw her dedication to that duty on that occasion and since, and we thank her for that also. Going back, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the original question and uh, discussions and work around veterinary arrangements in relation to goods checks. Can I ask the um, Deputy First Minister to give an update on the work of the Joint Specialist Working Group? Yes. Um, so the, the First Minister and I attended um, a meeting of the Joint Committee back on the 24th of February. And at that meeting, I had welcomed the commitment um, from the co-chairs to the proper implementation of the protocol and also on their focus on finding solutions acceptable to all, as well as highlighting that the Joint Committee is the forum for constructive discussion on these issues and actually the, the mechanism which was agreed to iron things out. Um, we also made, and I made the case that the business community here want that stability, they want the certainty, as well as the fact that they want simplification where it can be achieved. Um, the First Minister had outlined the impact of the protocol and told the EU that the solution to the challenges we face should be fit for purpose and not imposed. And, but both teams, both the, on the British Government side and the EU, agreed that their teams should continue to engage further in technical discussions and come back to the Joint Committee. So I look forward to that um, work happening and for us to be invited again back for further discussion around uh, where we've got to. But I think that there are some um, positive noise in terms of perhaps some, some, some issues being resolved. Nicole John Stewart. Number two, please. With your permission, can Cordia Junior Minister Kearney will answer question number two. The first phase of the Cross Executive Action Plan on tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime ended on the 31st of March 2021. And within that plan, the Executive Office has lead responsibility for delivering actions B1 to B4. Actions B1 to B3 relate to the reintegration of those with conflict-related convictions who have identified obstacles to employment, financial services and travel, among other things. Good progress has been made, including adoption of the employer's guidance on recruiting people with conflict-related convictions by the civil service. Work continues to improve access to financial services and also international travel. In relation to Action B4, known as the Communities in Transition Project, Phase 1 has seen contracts awarded for delivery of over 30 individual projects and two regional programmes across eight areas of focus. A mid-term evaluation of implementation so far has been completed, which shows that a significant amount of good work has emerged through the project to date. The Executive has agreed to a further phase 
of the wider Tackling Paramilitary Activity, Criminality and Organised Crime programme to be delivered up until March 2024. The Communities in Transition project will be a significant part of the community-facing element of the programme in Phase 2. It should also be noted that the Communities in Transition project is only one of many interventions that are being funded as part of the Tackling Paramilitarism programme, which also includes policing responses and focused youth interventions, amongst others. A lasting impact, however, will only be achieved with all parts of the programme operating in partnership. Supplementary, John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I take the opportunity also to thank the First Minister for many years of dedicated public service and wish her and her family well for the next steps. Um, thank the Junior Minister for his answer. Does he agree with me that there, was, there is no justification and there has never been any justification for the existence of paramilitary terrorist activity? Given the recent attacks, particularly on off-duty police officers, especially in my constituency of East Antrim, does he agree that the security forces should be given all the power they require to take these organisations off their street? And will he also assure the public that the policy of paying off paramilitaries will cease forthwith? I thank the member for his question. I, I, I dispute the point around uh, paying off paramilitaries to make them go out of existence. I, I don't think that that is a correct characterisation of the work of this programme. Uh, but I absolutely agree with you in your condemnation of the uh, attack on the police officer and his family in Larne in your constituency, and I also want to associate myself to condemnation of the attack on the police officer and her family in Dungiven uh, just previous to that. There is no room, no scope, no role for paramilitary or organised crime gangs within this society. It is the antithesis of what we need to see in terms of developing a united, shared community. And we must, as an executive, bend our collective efforts to ensuring that this programme in and of itself is effective and delivers the, re the desired results, but that through political leadership across all five parties who are members of our executive, that we speak with one voice, who will make a kind to Ian Gook in our absolute unequivocal opposition to uh, any further use of violence against police officers or any other public servants in our society. I call her Leah Flynn. And maybe just to follow on from uh, Mr Stewart's point, Minister, we know that over the past number of weeks we have seen that destructive influence um, that paramilitaries can have on our society um, within the working class loyalist communities, also the murderous int intent of the so-called dissident microgroups. Um, and would the Minister agree that these gangs need to be condemned outrightly and they need to be urgently removed from our society and for those who refuse to abandon that criminal activity that they must face the full consequences of our criminal justice system. Well, and, and, and it does complement the question posed by the, uh, by, by the previous member and I absolutely agree. Uh, 23 years on after the uh, Good Friday Agreement, there can be no place for paramilitary groups in this society, for criminality or for organised crime groups or for narco gangs. Uh, they neither care for or offer any type of future. And what we're seeing in terms of the manipulation of young people and the destructive violence which is being used, which has very, very serious potential implications for, uh, for, for life and safety within our society, all of that must be removed. Just like sectarianism and all forms of bigotry and intolerance, these elements are a cancer in our society. So I have a very clear message uh, to echo what I said in response to Mr Stewart. Those involved in violence, criminal damage, manipulation of our young people and attacks on the PSNI must now stop. There should be no ambiguity around that issue whatsoever. They must be uh, brought before the courts and made amenable and held to account because they are enemies of our peace process. And making politics is key to building a future free from paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime and the influence of these uh, narco gangs. So we are at a point, there's a choice to make, the choice of either race to the bottom or a peaceful, democratic, 
political way forward and safer communities. And that will be found through full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. And as I said earlier, Mr. Speaker, all of our parties on the executive working together in concert and in lockstep. Thank you. And I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, a mention was made about making politics work. What message does it send when a party on the executive names constituency offices after those who have engaged in terrorist criminal acts, or when elected representatives of that party hail and eulogise those who engaged in terrorist criminal acts, including most recently a member of the European Parliament? I thank the member for his question, and if he was listening carefully to what I said, we need to speak with one consistent, united voice in our opposition to all forms of violence, terror, paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime in our society. And I am sure, having listened to the member speak on many occasions, that we are at one in relation to that ambition and that responsibility. And Sinn Féin will not be found wanting in our responsibility, along with other executive colleagues, in taking that agenda forward and ensuring that this paramilitarism, anti-paramilitarism programme, which we have responsibility for seeing delivered, is in fact effectively delivered and that it becomes a foundation stone for how in fact we can have a stable, functioning society with good politics at its heart and proper power sharing. I call Jim Allister. The, hyper the hyperbola. How does the Minister reconcile proclaimed dedication to tackling paramilitarism with continuing glorification of terrorism, as highlighted by Mr Stolford? We all know that a Sinn Féin MP still has the name of his office glorifying two individuals, McNulty and McGorian, who lived and died as terrorists. So long as there is glorification of terrorism, it will be nothing but Canton hypocrisy to talk about tackling paramilitarism. Well, I thank the member for his question, and I won't take lectures from you or your ilk in relation to these matters. My credentials in relation to standing up against paramilitarism, organised crime, criminality, sectarianism and intolerance in this society are beyond dispute. And I can assure the House that I will continue to provide that type of leadership when others, perhaps in this House, and perhaps as I look towards the member in question, feel in their responsibility to provide unambiguous leadership for the future. And I call order, order. I call the Lords Kelly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure there'll be uh, another opportunity to say, but uh, can I offer my um, uh, best wishes to the First Minister and hope that she will look forward to spending time with her family, some of whom would not have known her outside of the political life, and, and have that family time together. That would be very precious to her and to them. But in, in relation to the Communities in, in Transition funding and the, the next round of uh, funding allocation um, and, and the review that the Junior Minister referred to, can he tell me then uh, which programmes will be um, uh, and uh, the objectives, what will be the objectives for the next round of funding? And will we see a greater uh, integration and opportunity for others outside of those who have already successfully uh, received some of that funding? And will some of that money be skewed towards better outcomes in tackling poverty and low educational outcomes? As often case, occur, I thank the member for her, her question. I think the member knows very well that the, uh, the issues that we face are, are integrated, uh, that poverty is an integral part of the society. Poverty breeds disenchantment, it breeds alienation, and that creates the circumstances where paramilitary organisations and also where criminal gangs can actually seek to manipulate young people from. So what we need is a holistic approach. I believe that thus far in phase one we have seen that type of uh, integrated approach taken forward. When we are responsible for the allocation of public monies, it is essential that at all stages we are looking to ensure that uh, the funding is being uh, targeted where it is most required on an objective need basis, that we are getting value for money. 
The indications in relation to the evaluation to date is that that has been in fact the case in relation to phase one of communities in transition. But we, we are now moving into a pre-market consultation. Uh, there will then be a new round of public procurement for uh, organisations to participate in phase two and all of the appropriate rules and regulations in terms of good governance and also public procurement will apply at that stage. Moving on, I call Jonathan Buckley. Three. I'm going to can call you. Um, as you'll be aware, the Executive's COVID Task Force is leading and coordinating an integrated programme of work of response to and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. On the 15th of April, the Executive made wide, a wide range of decisions to reopen many aspects of our economy and our society over the coming weeks. In line with these decisions, the uh, task force has been at the forefront of coordinating engagement with key sectors through meetings with key representatives in the hospitality and retail sectors. The task force adds value to the recovery process by providing advice on key messages and mitigations to help increase adherence to the public health regulations and to guidance. The adherence work stream of the task force has facilitated the, facilitated the provision of specialist behavioural insights advice in relation to the pathway out of restrictions, supporting sectors to ensure that they are reopened in a safe and well-managed way. In addition to the work of the task force, the executive has agreed to extend financial assistance to sectors that are still restricted or partially restricted under the COVID regulations. This includes extending the provision of the localised restrictions support scheme to hospitality and gym businesses, payments to the businesses under the COVID uh, restrictions, the CRBSS and the large hospitality and tourism business support schemes up until the 23rd of May for those businesses that remain um, eligible. Supplementary, Jonathan Bugley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And while I welcome the opening of our society, and in particular the business and hospitality sector, the Minister will know that there was quite a bit of ambiguity around the uh, rules and regulations surrounding that reopening. Could I ask uh, the Deputy First Minister, with that in mind, what consultation has there been with the Executive Task Force with local councils to ensure that we have a continuity of approach in how they deal with the hospitality sector in particular as they deal with these difficult circumstances in the immediate weeks? Well, just to say, I, mean, I, I concur. I mean, there's been a lot of, uh, I think, maybe not joined up, not, not necessarily an, an, a, a good joined up approach across council areas. You can see different approaches in different areas. So the, um, the junior ministers are trying to coordinate that work to bring the council uh, leads together. Uh, we saw in different parts where um, businesses got ready for opening up last week and then perhaps didn't get a chance to open or had to amend what they had done. And, and a lot of these businesses went to you know, huge financial um, costs to try to get their businesses ready to open. So I think it's so important that there isn't a blade of grass in terms of the approach that, of difference uh, in terms of the approach that we need to work with the hospitality sector and all the business community actually to get them ready for a state of opening. I mean, last week was a good news story. We've got a great place in terms of the COVID um, response. We are winning in the battle against COVID and with the public continued support, we'll continue to, you know, in this um, positive vein. However, there does seem to have been um, some disparity of approach and we will try to rectify that. I also, and I know that the First Minister agrees with me in this, that we want the strongest possible communication with both the task force and the hospitality sector itself to make sure that where there are issues that need to be resolved, that they can be resolved. Call Pat Kepney. And may I also take the chance of offering our First Minister uh, time to reflect as she moves into that most beautiful of counties, Fermanagh, and no doubt she will, and wish you all the best going forward. Mr Speaker, uh, I wanted to ask the uh, Deputy First Minister or the First Minister uh, outlined in the actions taken by the COVID-19 task force to facilitate the reopening of businesses and of hospitals. Vitality. Can you tell how that is going to help or what they are trying to do in order to keep those businesses afloat and open? Well, as the member knows, that um, from the 30th of April we had agreed to reopen unlicensed premises um, outdoors only with a maximum of six for two households, uh, reopening licensed premises including social clubs outdoors again with the limits in terms of, of people from uh, no more than two households. The curfew is gone on takeaways, the curfew is gone on off licences. And then we have the indicative date of the 24th of May, where we're 
hoping to be able to have unlicensed and licensed premises indoors with mitigations opened up. So we hope that that is welcome news for the hospitality sector and the priority for the coming weeks has to be, as I've said previously, is to continue to engage with the sector to make sure that um, they have all the support that we can possibly offer them, both as a, an executive, as a task force, as a local government, um, all the supports that are, that are required. It's in everybody's interest. We want to have this, the, the industry up and running again. We want to see people back in their place of employment. We want to see people out enjoying themselves and, and having a meal and, and uh, you know, getting out and about again. Um, and we want this to be sustainable and continue on our positive vein. But it will only be through communi continued communication that we will be able to do that. Call Pat Sheehan. Um, enormous progress has been made uh, in terms of tackling the virus. Uh, and as we move forward to further ease restrictions, would the Minister uh, agree with me that care and caution need to be the watchwords, especially when we take account of what is happening in India at the minute? And even here, uh, the news that a number of people who have already been vaccinated have ended up in ICU with COVID-19. Thank the member for his question, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, COVID has no respect for, for timetables or for dates, um, and there's also no doubt that this has been one of the toughest times for people, for families, for businesses, for workers, um, and for all in our community. And when you look towards examples of uh, across the world of how the pandemic is behaving, I think we have to continue to be careful, continue to be cautious, make steady progress, keep going in the one direction. Um, but you know that the restrictions that we've had in place have been necessary at a point in time to suppress the virus and continue to save lives and to protect our health service. So we can only continue to keep moving forward whenever we've received or we've maximised the mitigations that are, that are in place and make sure that we do not go backwards. So um, we want to continue to be positive and give people that hopeful message. But I think it's important to say that we do face risks from variants of concern. Um, we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, we do face risks from people getting together and perhaps being too relaxed. So we need to encourage people to continue to take all the possible steps we can as individuals to protect ourselves and others and to be mindful of the continued public health message around washing our hands and wearing our face coverings and limiting our social contacts and also that when we are out and about fresh air and ventilation are part of our protection. So let's not be complacent and we can continue to make progress. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, Mr Speaker, first of all, if I can just add a few, my words to those of others in relation to the First Minister and wish her well in the future. Uh, Minister, looking forward uh, from where we are in relation to recovery from COVID-19, you have a task force. The Minister for the Economy has a high street task force and the Minister for Infrastructure has a responsibility around planning. Can you tell us what joined up actions you will be taking in relation to all of those areas to reimagine our public spaces, particularly in the delivery of um, business on the high street? I th and all those pieces of work are, um, they have to interact with each other. I mean, they can't do any of these things in a standalone um, way. To have an economic recovery uh, package, it has to take into account you know, the actions which the Economy Department have identified. However, as you've rightly um, identified, we also have the um, High Street Task Force, which I'm glad to say, after maybe perhaps a slower start than we would have wanted, is now off to, to a good pace. But these things have to talk to each other, have to complement each other. And you know, there's no doubt the implications of the pandemic on our society have been immense and on our economy and have been immense. And as I've said on many occasions in this um, chamber, um, there are some sections of our economy that have been hit worse than others, the hospitality sector being one, tourism completely on its knees. So we have a huge amount of work there to do to be able to rebuild. Um, and it's going to take us collectively working together. So we see it very much as um, the economic recovery package, the programme for government, all these things um, coming together and as an executive planning our way out of this. I call Mark Durgan. Unfortunately, there will be no time for a supplementary. Question four. Your permission, uh, I'm going to ask Minister Kearney to answer this question. I thank the member for his question. And after some very disappointing and erroneous reporting, about the Communities in Transition project, I do welcome this timely opportunity to remind members and the public what this important project aims to achieve. Communities in Transition is about helping communities to break free from the grip of paramilitarism. It is designed and delivered to empower and support those within communities which have been negatively affected by paramilitarism, criminality and ongoing coercive control. 
to bring about positive change. And stark contrast to one unhelpful and grossly inaccurate media report, it is not designed to assist paramilitary and criminal organisations becoming community organisations. Any such suggestion is an insult to those working to support communities on the ground. Funding for the Communities in Transition project, which is part of the executives tackling paramilitary criminality and organised crime programme, was due to end in March 2021. During the first phase of delivery, that is from November 2019 until March 2021, the project had a budget of $8.5 million, which has had a significant impact within local communities, from helping establish local community safety fora to re-imaging murals, for example. In July 2020, the Executive committed to extending the programme for a further three years, up until March 2024, subject to budget availability and match funding support for the programme. This match funding was confirmed in February, and as a result, the Communities in Transition project is set to receive an additional contribution of £10 million over three years to support delivery of the next phase of the project from April 2021 until March 2024. And while this sum falls short of the initial bid of £12 million, which was made to support delivery, it is a positive development that the project has much up. more surety on multi-year funding rather than being part of an annual cycle. That concludes the period for a list of questions, members, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical. Uh, Trevor Lone is not in his place. And can we bring the member Daniel McCrossan on screen, please? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Joint First Minister for the answers to uh, questions so far. Can I first add my voice to other members in wishing the First Minister well uh, for the future uh, in, in whatever uh, path she takes? Uh, I know there's things that we haven't agreed with, but I know that the First Minister has always put the interests of her constituency first and has done her best to serve uh, those she represents. Uh, I'll move to a question, uh, and uh, Deputy First Minister, uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson this week revealed that he believes that social distancing could end by the 21st of June. Is there a similar approach anticipated for here, or has there been discussions at the executive in relation to it? Member for his question, and just to say, no, that hasn't been discussed. I mean, I, I've noted uh, Boris Johnson's commentary. However, um, the health minister hasn't brought such a proposal to the executive at, at this point um, for discussion. But I'm sure that over due course, that's a discussion that we will have to have. Supplementary, Mr. Crossan. I thank the Joint First Minister for uh, her answer. Can I uh, further ask uh, what the Deputy First Minister? Joint First Minister's assessment is of what Boris Johnson said, uh, given that there are still serious concern about infection uh, increasing in our community and also those who have received vaccinations, as Mr Sheehan has pointed out, uh, still testing positive and ending up in ICU. Was this premature and unhelpful? Well, um, certainly, um, I haven't always agreed with Boris Johnson's approach in terms of the COVID crisis. Um, so let me say this. Um, we make our decisions based on the advice from our own public health team um, and certainly at this moment in time there's no advice that suggests that this is where we um, can change things. Ultimately of course it's where we want to get to but it has to be done in a safe and steady way. It has to be done in a way that doesn't uh, walk us into a corner where we'd have to reverse. Again we want to make sure that we make steady progress. There are still risks out there, there are new variants. We need to be very very careful. Uh, let's continue to make progress and build on the positivity uh, of where we're at in terms of our vaccination programme. Um, you know, we understand from an economic point of view how, in order to make hospitality business, for example, um, sustainable and profitable, um, that they need to be able to get back to uh, their, the numbers that they would have had um, prior to COVID. We want to get them there too, but um, I think it's going to take a bit of time, and we need to be um, continuing to make progress and a bit of steady as you go um, over the course of the next number of months. I call Paul Flew. We are the only part of the United Kingdom that has an isolation period after travelling around the country. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister how this can be justified, considering the impact on people being stranded from close family members for so long? So again, um, the public health advice, we've had this discussion now um, on a number of occasions at the Executive, and we continue to keep it under review. We actually had this discussion last week, particularly around the travel in the, in the common travel area. 
Um, there is now a situation where, for example, you can travel from Scotland to here, but not vice versa. And there are families that have been you know, distanced for um, over a year now, and we want to get that um, remedied as soon as we can. Health have asked us to keep us under uh, advice, to keep, to, continue, to keep coming back to it, and we've decided that that's what we'll do. So I would expect we'll have further discussion on the common travel area over the course of this week's executive and it's probably into next week as well. Supplementary, Paul Frew. The Deputy First Minister for her uh, answer. Given that hospitality has paid a high price to protect people's health uh, and that we'll need interventions well past reopening, does the Minister support Hospitality Ulster's modest request to establish a ministerial cross departmental working group to oversee its recovery? And if so, what will that look like? Um, the, the member probably wasn't in the chamber just when we were speaking of this earlier, and I made the point that there needs to be strong communication between the hospitality sector and the executive task force and all of our departments who have got a remit in some way or other um, around hospitality. We need to make it as um, viable as we can for them to be able to open up. We want to be able to keep them opened up, um, so that's why we need to be careful and sustainable. But um, communication is the way to do that. And unfortunately, over the last week and a half, certainly we've seen uh, where there was disparity across different council areas in terms of approach. Uh, we're trying to get that ironed out. I think that's really, really important. Um, but uh, both, as I said, myself and the First Minister have made, uh, raised the issue of the need to engage with the hospitality sector in a more meaningful way if we're going to help people to be successful in opening up during these challenging times. You call Philip McQuig. Uh, Collier, uh, if I could ask the Joint First Minister if she agrees with me that misogyny and sexism in public life such as that referred to last week by the First Minister uh, and also by the, the disgraceful and disgusting comments directed at yourself, uh, Minister, by a DUP councillor from Mid East Antrim Council, are totally unacceptable and a real deterrent to uh, women in public life. Um, thanks to the member for, for, um, for raising that. And, and whilst the comments that you refer to were directed at me, I also want to acknowledge that the First Minister has also recently referred to misogyny that she's had to contend with as DUP leader, and I think we've both said that on many of occasions in terms of what you face in leadership, um, particularly in terms of misogynistic commentary, as actually as, as many others in this chamber can testify to the hurt that that causes, not just to them as individuals, but also to, to our families. Um, as a mother and a daughter and a sister, you know, a partner, that's often you know, the most distressing part, it's the hurt that causes to your, to your family. So I think we all have to realise in, in political life and all political parties must take this on board that um, all of that abuse impacts on the reluctance of women um, to engage in public life. Um, so it's a hugely important issue and one is the ability to impact on the representativeness of, um, of our administration. So it needs to be confronted and also, you know, most importantly, needs to be condemned at every turn. Supplementary, Philip McGuigan. And uh, I thank uh, the Joint First Minister for her answer. And I note the comments about the hurt uh, on the person that the comments are directed, but also in relation to the wider hurt caused to the family. Uh, can I ask the, the Minister if she agrees that whilst it's wrong for anyone uh, to engage in this kind of sexist uh, and misogynistic uh, abuse, it is entirely reprehensible rather, when it comes from uh, an elected representative, as was the case recently uh, by the comments from DUP councillor John Carson? Yeah, I mean, I, I said I think there should be zero tolerance in society to misogyny and any form of intolerance or indeed any form of discrimination. And if that's going to be achieved, then political leaders will have to lead. There's responsibility in all of us in this chamber, and that's why I welcome the fact that the members actually raised the issue. And um, to be very clear that misogyny will not be tolerated within. Um, political parties and to speak out against it whenever we see it in society. Before I call the next speaker questioner, could I remind members that their mobile phones are being operated at the moment and they're disrupting the sound system here. This will affect Hans Sard. I call her Leah Flynn. Um, and maybe just before I ask this question, I would like to um, say my very best wishes to um, the First Minister. Um, but Joint First Minister, the basis of the restoration of the Assembly and the Executive last year um, were commitments made in the new decade, new approach. And would the Joint First Minister agree that whatever the outcome of the process to appoint um, a new First Minister, that these commitments need to be honoured? Yes. Um, firstly, let me say that you're, you're absolutely correct that the new decade, new approach provided the basis for the restoration of the institution, so there can't be any slippage from the commitments that were made in that deal. Citizens need to see delivery and politics must work for everybody and commitments that are 
be made must be honoured, and I think that's, that's crucially important. I, like everybody else, want to wish Arling the very best in her future. I know I said it publicly last week, but just given that um, people are commenting today, I just want to wish you the very best for the future also, and whatever that brings um, for you. Um, I also want to say that you know, I, my determination is to work um, closely with um, the incoming minister, and there should be a no doubt of my determination to ensure that delivery of the outstanding commitments, particularly where citizens' rights are yet to be delivered, in respect of language and culture, legacy and women's health care. And thank you to the, the Joint First Minister for that response and those assurances. And I suppose that sounds like a very firm and clear commitment um, to hopefully see that full implementation of the new decade, new approach. Um, but could the Minister also maybe provide an update on what discussions are taking place with the two governments um, in relation to their own commitments in the agreement? Um, thanks again. I mean, they're, they're very clear and binding obligations on both governments, both the Irish government and the British government, to deliver um, within the NDNA deal and previous deals. And particularly now, as we're starting to emerge from the pandemic and move into being able to deliver on things that perhaps have been delayed, uh, we have to have that commitment, uh, and we need to see it every day from both Dublin and London, and um, to that end, to ensure that all aspects of the new decade, new approach commitments are lived up to. Nicole Gemma Dolan. Gormayoga can call you, and like everyone else, can I also wish the First Minister and my constituency colleague all the best in the future? Um, can I ask the Joint First Minister, would you agree with me that ongoing illegal street protests are unacceptable and need to be brought to an end? Yes, I mean, there's, there's, there's no place for illegality in, in society and in, in our society. And, and many of these protests have been, they've been reckless, um, they've been irresponsible, and they've been a clear attempt to raise community tensions um, rather than err some kind of grievance. So um, political leaders need to take a stand against this kind of damaging behaviour rather than, which has been unfortunately the case from some, not all, um, from some political parties, providing justification for it uh, as opposed to condemning it. Supplementary, Gemma Dolan. And given the very serious implications of these protests and their potential to turn violent, would the Minister agree that all political leaders should now call for an immediate end to illegal street protests? Yes, I mean, we have seen time and time again that these protests can turn violent, so it is incumbent upon um, all political leaders to send a very clear message that those involved in violence, those involved in criminal damage, manipulate uh, manipulation of our young people and attacks on the PSNI, I mean, they all must stop. We all have a responsibility to build uh, to, to peace and to make a politics work. So again, I urge all those in political leadership to join me in calling for an end to all illegal street protests. Roy Beggs, not in his place, I call Dagna Magalier. Uh, Ministry, you just made uh, reference there in relation to attacks on the PSNI. In light of the disgraceful attacks on a police officer's home in Larne recently, will you join with me in firstly obviously condemning this here, but also calling for an end to the reckless and unacceptable rhetoric that we've seen from some people in political leadership and, uh, which have been targeting the PSNI? Thank the member um, for, for raising that. And, and of course, all in political leadership have a responsibility to unreservedly condemn um, this despicable attack on a police officer and his family in the place that they should feel safest. I mean, that's their home. And again, um, even the, the week before that, also the attack on the, the female officer as well. All those reckless um, actions remind us all that words and the manner in which they are used have consequences. And there can be no place for inflammatory or incendiary language when it um, when what is required is progressive and positive leadership at these times. Dagnan Magalier, supplementary. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Minister. And obviously, Minister, will you join with, with me and indeed this House in sending solidarity to the police officer and the families who were victims of this reprehensible act? Of course, of course I will. And I can only imagine the distress and the anxiety that was caused to um, this PSNI officer and his family. And as I said, and to the, the, the female officer um, over the past number of weeks. And it's important that we all across this chamber stand in solidarity with the officer and his family and reaffirm our commitment to uphold and protect the rights of every citizen to live free from threat or intimidation going about their job. I call Jim Allister, um, and you may not have time for okay. the supplementary. Uh, truth and justice is a phrase that the Deputy First Minister has recourse to from time to time. In light of last night's BBC programme, does she acknowledge as the truth that the Northern Bank robbery was indeed the work of the IRA? 
I didn't watch last night's programme. Supplementary, Mr. Allister. Well, watching it or not, does she accept it was the truth that the IRA robbed the Northern Bank? And can she, as a leader of the Republican movement, tell us where the money is? Funny enough, this isn't something that was discussed at the executive meeting. And time is up. Members, take a raise for a moment, please.